Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Briz Science. Thank you, a huge crowd tonight. Great to see you all here. Really excited to get into it. Uh, Briz Science is the University of Queensland's free public lecture series of science where we bring not just the best scientists, but also the best communicators to share their research with you here in Brisbane. We're, of course, hosted by The Edge, our wonderful venue partners who have lots of great activities going on, which we'll talk about more shortly. And I'm your host for this evening, Joel Gilmore. Uh, I'd also like to take this opportunity to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting tonight and to pay my respects to elders both past and present. Tonight, we are going to be taking a look back into Australia's past, a long way back, our dinosaur past. And we have the very talented Dr. Steve Salisbury to present for us. So he's going to do a presentation, then we're going to take some questions at the end. We take questions either on those question slips you picked up on the way in, or on Twitter, hashtag BrizScience. So uh, if you have your phone on, you turn it off, or silent now, and load up Twitter, ready to go, and we'll be live tweeting throughout the evening. After the talk, we will also have some food and drinks available outside, and we'd love for you to join us, and Steve will be available to answer lots more questions if we don't get through everything on stage. Um, I think that's everything for the setup. Great. So uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce, as I said, Dr. Steve Salisbury tonight. Steve has presented to Briz Science once before a few years ago, so we're really excited to have him back and get a bit of an update on his uh, projects. He's a senior lecturer at the School of Biological Sciences at the University of Queensland, and he researches, amongst many things, the evolution of Gondwanan vertebrate continental vertebrates even, in particular dinosaurs and crocodilians. There are some challenges, however, most notably that very few fossils have ever been found in Australia. Fortunately, Steve, like life, finds a way. There's a little Jurassic Park joke there for the aficionados and things. Great, and on that note, could you please join me in welcoming Dr. Steve Salisbury. <laughs> All right, I'll find a way. Um, all right, so just before I start, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the Brisbane River Valley, the Yugara and Turbul people. Um, as you'll see through tonight's talk, I've, I myself have got a much deeper appreciation of what that means to be a traditional custodian. Um, tonight, I want to talk to you about Australian dinosaurs. And to kick it off, I want to see how much you know about Australian dinosaurs. Who can tell me the name of an Australian dinosaur? I oh, know, shout it out. You got to have the, right. Here we go. Quantosaurus, yeah. Australia Veneta, yes. Yeah. So we got one from Victoria, one from Queensland. Mataburrosaurus, also from Queensland. Queensland does pretty well. Here we go. No. Triceratops is from North America. <laughs> We're talking about Australian dinosaurs tonight. Any more? All right, well, that's why we're here. But, oh, which one? Quantosaurus? Chronosaurus? No, Chronosaurus is a marine reptile. So around at the same time as dinosaurs, but not a dinosaur. So the thing is, just about all of Australia's dinosaurs come from just a handful of areas. So some of the better known ones, someone mentioned Mataburrosaurus from Mataburra up in northwest Queensland. Coombarosaurus, we recently renamed a little armoured dinosaur also from that area near a town called Richmond. Um, a lot of stuff around Winton. There's several new sauropods and Australovenator that you mentioned is from the Winton area. Quantosaurus, one of the dinosaurs of darkness down from Dinosaur Cove in southern Victoria. There's also a few things, opalised fossils that have turned up in New South Wales and the um, opal fields, places like Andamooka. Um, <coughs> and that's pretty much it. Um, there's the South Australian opalised fossils. Um, all these are from the east coast. 
And as you'll see in, in a little while, nearly all of them are from roughly the same age rocks, so from around the same time period. There's a handful of things in Western Australia, but really a handful. They fit in a shoebox, a few fragments. They're a bit hard to identify. Um, they don't really tell us much. One thing that people often forget are tracks. Probably the best known of all Australia's dinosaur track sites, at least until now, has been a place called Lark Quarry, also near Winton, and in the same rocks as those that produce all those sauropods and theropods. There are a couple of tracks from down in Victoria, um, in areas around Dinosaur Cove. And then what I want to talk to you about tonight is the dinosaur tracks of the Kimberley up around Broome. And this is a very important area, not only because of the diversity of tracks that it preserves, but also because of its age. So dinosaurs and the, the fossils <coughs> that represent them don't occur just anywhere. You need to be in the right age rocks and also the right type of rocks. These are the, the basins, so depositional areas where rivers and things flow during the age of dinosaurs, where we find dinosaur fossils. So all of the Queensland and New South Wales ones are in the Aramanga and Surat basins. The Victorian stuff is in the Otway and Gippsland. And then these ones over in South Australia are in those basins there, the Canning the Can and the Carnarvon and Perth. <coughs> this is the time span through the sort of end of the age of dinosaurs, the Cretaceous period. So dinosaurs existed all through the Mesozoic. This period of time spans from around 144 million years ago, so down here, up to about 66, 65 million years ago, when a lot of the non-avian dinosaurs went extinct, when there was a, a massive asteroid impact um, in the Yucatan Peninsula of Me Mexico. And Aramanga and Surat, the Otway, there's those other ones, but most of our fossils come from this time period. So between about 115 million years ago and about 90 million years ago. So outside of that bracket, we know very little about Australia's dinosaur fauna. There are just no fossils. And it's an important time period because that's when the great southern landmass of Gondwana is starting to break up and distinct dinosaur faunas are beginning to appear around the world. So if we put our dinosaurs onto this Cretaceous time map, I won't go into the details, but here's all our Winton things, the sauropods and Australovanida. There's the ones from further south. Here's all the Victorian ones. So it's all through that area, all our, all our kids' dinosaur books, all the research papers and stuff, they're all focused on this time period and these animals. Okay? We don't know very much at all about anything else. There's a few, as I said, there's a few scraps from down here, but um, they're hard to place in terms of their age and they're also not very informative. So this is where we've started to look more closely at dinosaur tracks. And tracks can do a lot of good things. They, unlike fossils, tell you exactly where a dinosaur was and what it was doing. I mean, it was there, it walked there, you can see the track. You know this is an area where a dinosaur once lived. Fossils are often transported long distances and um, a lot of the time you don't get all of the animal, you just get some teeth or a bit of a leg bone or something. The tracks tell you where the dinosaurs were and you get a lot of information about the anatomy, particularly of the foot. <laughs> Obviously being a track, that's what you're going to get out of it. Um, if, you, if you get good sequences of tracks, it can tell you how they moved. And then if you get a lot of tracks in an area, you can get information about how dinosaurs might have behaved together. Did they move in herds? Were they social? Um, were there any sort of things you can reconstruct interactions between them? That can all be preserved in stone in tracks. And if you've got lots of tracks and you've got a very good record and, and look at the rocks that they're in, you might be able to get 
any indication of aspects of dinosaur ecology? Did certain dinosaurs have a preference for particular habitats? How diverse were they and how abundant were they in those habitats and through time? Tracks can start to tell you all of that sort of stuff. And one of the things we've always we've been really interested in is using tracks to better understand our dinosaur fauna because it's all very focused on one particular time span. So we've been really trying to get into the Australian dinosaur track record for that reason. Um, <coughs> Some of them, you know, a lot of the tr tracks don't often get a lot of attention, so we've had to go and look at some of the, the old work that was done on, on obscure tracks. Um, and importantly, in recent years, as you'll see, there are a lot of advances that have happened in the way we can document and analyse tracks. You can do it all now with spectacular 3D models. You can get in the air with drones and laser scanners and all sorts of things that you couldn't do just a decade ago. So it's really helped advance the field. Now, probably most people, including myself, had never really heard of a place called James Price Point until a few years ago. And it got into the news when the then West Australian Premier, Colin Barnett, described it as a unremarkable beach. And here's his quote that he, that he came out with. The reason Colin Barnett was asked to talk about James Price Point would be because the West Australian Government had just announced that this area, which is up in the northwest of the state, in the Kimberley, around an area called the Dampier Peninsula, here's James Price Point, it's about 50 kilometres or so north of Broome. And the reason Barnett had mentioned it and wanted to kind of just talk it down, there's nothing really important here, was because it had been selected as the site for a onshore liquid natural gas processing facility for the Browse Basin. So this is the Browse Basin Gas Reserve and the plan was all the gas in these fields here was going to get piped down to James Price Point and liquefied and then shipped off and exported. And this project, when it was announced, and as it grew, burgeoned into this $45 billion project. So more than the MBN, more than just about any federal proposal that's come up in the last sort of 10 years. This was huge. Huge amounts of money were going to be tied up in this. It was led primarily by Woodside Petroleum, um, but also involved Shell, Exxon, Mitsui, a huge consortium of resource companies, and it was backed by the West Australian government. They were also in there with a vested interest. And this is what they were proposing, a facility like this. This is Woodside's Karatha LNG precinct um, down on the borough. And this is a stretch of coast. That's about 25 kilometres. There was going to be an onshore processing facility, a harbour, two pipelines, workers' facilities, and then a breakwater that they didn't show here that extended out for three kilometres to protect that harbour and all the ships coming in. So it was, it was huge. Now, most people, when you think of the area around Broome and the Kimberley, you probably think of camel rides on the beach. Um, Paleontologists, we think of it during the early Cretaceous because in that particular area we have rocks from that time period. And back then, so here's Australia. This is about 130 million years ago when the rocks around Broome were deposited. Australia was connected to Antarctica. India was not very far away, nor was Africa or South America. You could walk from Brisbane to Buenos Aires, no problem. And back then, this is when we had nearly cosmopolitan dinosaur faunas. And it was just at the point, you can see all these land masses which once formed this great supercontinent called Gondwana, they were starting to pull apart. And here's the Kimberley up here, and this is the Canning Basin, if you remember back to my basin model that I showed you. That's that area there. Most of Queensland was underwater, 
through this period. There was a big inland sea that came and went over most of the state, and this is where we get things like Kronosaurus a little bit later, living in those seas. But this area up here back then probably looked like this. So part of a vast river plain flowing into a delta. There must have been some volcanoes in the background because it's during the age of dinosaurs. Um, <laughs> but over these sand flats and these muds, dinosaurs left their tracks. And on either side were these fern and, and cycad forests. So you wouldn't have been watching camel rides down on Cable Beach. You probably would have been cowering in the bushes as a giant sauropod wandered past. Now, dinosaurs and dinosaur tracks in the Kimberley are not a new thing, not at all. They've been known about probably for thousands of years. This is an area that's really unique where fossils, and in this case, dinosaur tracks and plant fossils, are woven into the cre creation mythology of the indigenous people of this area. They form part of a song cycle and they relate to the journeys of a creation being known as Morella, the emu man. And wherever Morella went, singing country into, into existence, giving law, he left behind his tracks, which look like the tracks of giant emus. And this is a depiction here showing Morella's tracks. And various stories include Morella, various Dreamtime stories from this area, the Bugaragara, as it's known there. And when Morella left, he passed into the sky and settled into the Milky Way. And many Dreamtime stories and cultures across all the language groups in Australia incorporate the emu that sits within the Milky Way in the dark space within the Milky Way. You need to be out away from the city lights to see it. And it pretty much spans half of the sky and has the shape of an emu. So this is a depiction of Morella as the emu man in the sky and also showing his tracks. And a lot of what we know about Morella first came to the attention of Europeans through the work of Paddy Rowe, former Order of Australia medal winner. And he was a, well, the founder of the Galara Baloo. Um, long story, there, are, there were once many language groups through the Dampier Peninsula. The stolen generations, dispossession really changed all that. And late in the, sort of around the 1930s, the law for this area was, was passed to Paddy Row, whereas in the past it would have been shared amongst a number of lawmen along the coast. So he took all these stories, and the stories specifically for Morella incorporate tracks like this, and then also, really interestingly, um, things like this. So these, so this is not a, this is Morella's footprints, and then in areas where he created his law grounds, he sat down to have a rest, and being an emu, he left the impressions of his tail feathers in the mud. And I've got a replica of some of those there. I can show you a little bit later. So among the Galara Baloo and people, indigenous people of the, of the Kimberley, dinosaur tracks are part of their culture. They know about them, there are songs about them, there are stories. They're woven into their Dreamtime mythology and they feel a very strong link to these tracks and they have a very deep knowledge of where the tracks are and what's happened to them over literally hundreds of generations. Now we... Westerners, Europeans, didn't really come into knowledge of these dinosaur tracks until maybe around the turn of the 20th, 20th century, but definitely around 1935, when a group of girl guides stumbled across some tracks at a place called Ganthian Point, just out of Broome, better known as, as Minya, its traditional name. Um, <coughs> Sheila and Flora Miller found some of these Morella tracks down in the <coughs> rocks at low tide. And they became well known. The, the West Australian Museum was notified of these tracks. Um, they had a lot of school camps in this area during the 40s and 50s. Um, many photographs began to appear of these three-toed dinosaur tracks in the rock platforms down there near, just below the lighthouse. In 1952, 
The, the first scientific paper on these tracks appeared. It was written by the then curator of the West Australian Museum, Gallert. And in 1967, a big study was done by Ned Colbert and Duncan Merrilies from the West Australian Museum. Ned was from the American Museum of Natural History. And they mapped some of these tracks. They took plasts the casts of some of the better ones and they named them. Now with dinosaur tracks, you can't really ever be sure of what sort of dinosaur made them. It's hard to link them to specific dinosaurs that are known from bones. So we have our own system of classification that revolves around tracks. And these particular tracks were given the name Megalosaurus brumensis. And that means foot of the megalosaur from broom or of broom. And at the time, megalosaurs were a group of dinosaurs. So this a group of meat-eating dinosaurs might have looked a little bit like Australovenator. So around sort of metre and a half at the hip and maybe sort of five, six metres long. So this is the sort of animal that they thought made these tracks, which got the name Megalosaurus brumensis. And that, that was about it for 20 or 30 years until this bloke, Paul Folks, um, a keen naturalist, spent a lot of time on the foreshore around Broome, looking at things in the rock pools and stuff. And he, he started to notice weird things like this and, and was the first person to recognise that these were the tracks of sauropod dinosaurs. So not the, the three-toed tracks of theropods that were linked to the Morella story. These were a different type of track left by large four-legged, long-necked, long-tailed dinosaurs like um, Apatosaurus and Brontosaurus. Now, Paul and his then partner, Louise Middleton, got in touch with John Long at the West Australian Museum. And Paul and Louise had been working with Paddy Rowe, and Paddy Rowe had been showing them areas where there were other types of tracks along the coast, much farther north from Broome than just around Ganthium Point. And John, in his book in 1998, and there were a few little things that appeared before that, um, published some illustrations of what started to, to look like a really interesting dinosaur track fauna. So this is the, the Megalosaurus tracks made by theropod dinosaurs. There were some other ones that looked similar. The big round sauropod tracks that Paul Folks had identified. And then really exciting, some tracks that they thought at the time might pertain to stegosaurs. Now, the sauropod tracks, this is the first time anyone had identified sauropod tracks in Australia. There was nowhere else where there were sauropod tracks. And it was definitely the first time that anyone had proposed that there was anything to do with stegosaurs in Australia. So this was pretty exciting. Um, but there are lots of sensitivities associated with accessing these sites because of their cultural significance. And a lot of things happened during the 90s that really shut down research and not a lot of stuff happened until 2008 when James Price Point was selected as this site for the LNG precinct. And the West Australian Museum were asked to come in and do a, do a survey of the area to check whether or not there are any dinosaur tracks in that, pla in that region because the rocks looked the same as the ones around Broome where we'd seen Megalosaurus tracks. Um, and they surveyed this sort of stretch of coastline, about 20 kilometres or so, in the area that was proposed for the LNG precinct. Um, they said there are a couple of sauropod tracks, but they were a bit eroded, but, you know, nothing to worry about, hence an unremarkable beach. And when that was announced in 2010, and it was used to sort of promote the project and get it going, um, this is when... <coughs> The traditional custodians, the Galara Baloo, um, represented here now. So this is Paddy Rowe, he died in, in 2001. Um, and his three grandsons, Philip, Joseph and Richard, <coughs> took over as Marja or lawman for this area after he, after he passed away. And together with Louise Middleton, who had worked with Paul Folks, recognising those sauropod tracks back in the 90s, they knew that there was much more at James Price Point than the West Australian Museum had let on. And frustrated with 
you know, the possibility of losing that area to this huge industrial development. Um, they called me and they said, we need someone to come up here and look at these dinosaur tracks because if we don't, they're going to be lost. Um, I jumped at the chance to head up there, um, knowing the significance not only to the bigger project, but also the, the cultural significance linked to these tracks. It's really somewhere where you need to be invited, just didn't want to rock up and start wandering on the beach photographing tracks. So I went up, went to James Price Point, its traditional name is Womerden, and started to look through all these rocks here. This is all broom sandstone. It's the rock that has the tracks in it around broom. Spent a lot of time with Phil and here and with Richard learning what they knew and also getting my eye in and sharing what I could make out in the rocks as well and discovered that there was quite a lot there, much more than had been let on. So that was IRA, that was in 2011 started to, to commence this work. Um, and that was pretty much at, at the height of the campaign to save this area. There was a lot of resistance from the indigenous community because of the significance of this place to the song cycle. The name Walmerden relates to um, a great Jabba Jabba war, a warrior and law boss who lived in that area up until the 1930s. Um, and there are campgrounds, there are grave sites, and there are, of course, lots of dinosaur tracks known through this area. So they were very adamant that it needed to be protected, this living song cycle. The people of Broome love this area for those reasons, and also it's a great spot to go camping and fishing and stuff. They, they wanted to see it protected. And it all kind of came to a head the week that I first got there to have a, have a look at the tracks. And not a lot of what happened during that week made it into the mainstream media. So there were, there were various people filming aspects of it. Um, I got to see and experience a lot of it firsthand. And I think it's worth sort of seeing what happened because it was quite scary to, to see this going on in 2011. It was like a land grab. People were being told to get off and that they had no right to claim this area that they'd been looking after for thousands of years. So this is a clip from a documentary that was put together um, called Heritage Fight, and it shows what happened on Tuesday the 5th of July 2011 when 150 riot squad police came up to escort Woodside to get into the area to start drilling um, for geotechnical surveys to put the ground base in for this LNG precinct. So that's Joe Rowe, one of the lawmen. Section 91 from the land up. Should be attached to this. Okay. All right. Here's All right. a piece of paper that marks the parliament. I'm going to copy right. that. I've yeah. got evidence of that, mate. Yeah. yeah. When are you going track. to? When are you going to be in And I said, I said that the. Have a look at my gear. And I, Joe, yeah. Joe, have a look I'm at, trying to have, have, have a look at the damage already done. Relevant picture. Relevant picture. I stand here today. Stand here today. Boss, I want to see a piece of paper saying that Barnett can come and kill my culture. There's paperwork coming from up top to you guys. Where's the paperwork for us? That they're going to destroy my culture. Where is it? On what level? 24 years of my life I studied my law. I know that. Right? And this is my job. They're keeping you away from this country as indigenous people. You've got a right to be here.
people fought for years and years to get any kind of rights, and here you are just selling them out. What the hell are you doing? We're fighting that we're fighting for our country today. We're fighting for our country. Leave my country alone. It's a live country. <laughs> How can we stop them? I want the answer from you. How can we stop them? How are we going to fight them? We're fighting them really hard. So that's Joe Rose, uh, Patty Rose's daughter and <coughs> Joe's mum. And it was, it was heart-wrenching seeing that. People like Joe, who pretty much his... His life was devoted to protecting that country, protecting the song cycle. Phil, Richard, there was no consent given. Um, there had been no federal approval. This was what's referred to as compulsory acquisition. Um, seeing what they went through, seeing other people, this is Dave Giroux. He's in his 70s. He's a botanist. He worked with Paul Folks back in the 90s in this area, and that's his son, Frog, um, trying to protect him as he f was forced to the ground as the bulldozers came through. We knew the best thing that we could offer was the science. And fortunately, it was, a, it was completely serendipitous, during that week, Tony Burke from the, from SUPAC, the then environment, um, Minister sent up some heritage advisors to assess this area because the West Kimberley was being assessed for national heritage listing and they weren't sure whether there was any significance associated with claims of dinosaur tracks in this area. So we spent a few days with this is Brian Prince showing them around areas where these amazing dinosaur tracks were that we just started to get our head around since arriving. And Amazingly, in that week, we were able to convince people like Brian, and Brian was able to convince Tony Burke that this area held tremendous significance with regard to its dinosaur tracks. We got into the media. Um, you know, I guess it doesn't get any more political than this with this project. We had to take a stand. It was against the state government. It was against all their departments. It was against resource companies. but. 
we were doing it from this point of view of the science and the dinosaur tracks and also because we could see this incredible link that existed culturally to these people and, and they had literally nothing. They were getting bulldozed off their land um, and that area was going to go. So, you know, I had to get out there, I had to say what I thought um, and definitely the fight was on. A month later, Tony Burke announced that the Greater West Kimberley, including the coast with all the dinosaur tracks, would be National Heritage listed. Now, we were all really excited about this. This is the, the West Kimberley National Heritage Area. You can see the, the main part of it is up north of the Dampier Peninsula, and that little red strip was the bit that was added to include the dinosaur tracks at the very last minute. Now, you would assume National Heritage listing for scientific, natural heritage values, cultural values, all these things would protect an area. But the West Australian government completely ignored it and pushed on. In Ju July 2012, their then environment, Environmental Protection Agency approved the development. They said there weren't going to be any impacts on anything worthwhile based on the reports that have been done in 2010. And Bill Marmion, the, the WA Environment Minister, supposed to be protection for the environment, on radio he said, well, you know, if, if there's footprints there, they're just going to have to go. That was their attitude. Woodside, with their jack-up rigs, were getting really close to rock platforms where the dinosaur tracks are on. No one really knew what the law was, what the boundary was. All we knew is that we had to try and get a handle on what was there so we could spread the word and hopefully change the scenario. So we spent <coughs> many hours. We ended up over around sort of five or six years, probably spent around four to 500 hours, like literally on the ground, out on these reefs looking for dinosaur tracks. And the thing up there is you have daily tides of up to 10 metres. And all these tracks in the Broom Sandstone are only in the intertidal zone. So you're out there doing your thing, taking some notes and photos, and then next thing you know, um, <laughs> you've got to get back to shore. Um, and the tide, it comes up really fast. Now, that might all seem like good fun, and you know, it, most of the time it was, you know, as long as your cameras and stuff didn't get wet, you sort of weighed in when you had to. But one day, I think it wasn't this day, it was the following day, in that channel that we'd been wading through, documenting these tracks, um, one of our friends who was camped up on the point said, oh, you guys might want to come in a bit earlier next time because there was this croc swimming through there. <laughs> the crocs would come in with the tide They'd use it to come in through the channels and then get up onto the beach. Um, so that kind of yeah, changed our attitude a little bit to, to waiting. Um, but what we were doing out here, this particular spot, was documenting this. This is a dinosaur track, a um, new type of track that hadn't been seen before. And <coughs> just to help you orientate yourself, here's, here's the track. These are three digital impressions, so three toes. Dinosaurs walk right up on their toes. Not, not, they don't, they're not flat-footed like us. So in this particular instance, there's, not a, there's no heel. There's not even the rear of the foot. There are just three toes. The, if you think of a bird, the big toe points backwards. That's the hallux. And a lot of the time with dinosaurs on their feet, that big toe is halfway up the leg, so you don't even see it. So the first toe is the second one. Usually the biggest one that's pointing forward in these three-toed tracks is the third digit, and then this is the fourth one. So we were really interested in this one. Um, it was a really nice one. So what we ended up doing, because we didn't want to just take it, and, and you obviously couldn't, um, was to make a replica of it. So we used a rapid-setting silicon, stuff called pinky seal. It's really good, this fluoro pink color. You, any drips that you make on the rocks, you can easily see where they are, but it dries really quickly. Ten years ago, silicon would take days to dry. And when the area that you're trying to use your silicon in um, is underwater half the time, um, that's not very good. This stuff sets in about 20 minutes. So you paint it on over the track like this. It then comes out and you have a cast of the 
natural mould of the foot because a, a foot is a cast as well or a mould or footprint is a mould of a foot so this is a, a cast of a natural mould so there's the track there um, once we get it back to the lab um, we then back it and paint it with a polyurethane resin you then peel that off and that there is a plastic replica of that track that's out there on the rock platform. Then to, to make it look like it did, um, we paint all the oysters and little chitons and things. This is the, the track here, so it's not a big one. This, and this is the replica, so you can see the, the resin. And this is where we've painted it using some of the Pindan sand from that area to get the same red stain. And this is a really good way for us to start to study this in the lab. And we worked out this particular track it's the same as some of the tracks that you get up at Lark Quarry. It can be assigned to a track type called Winternopus latimorum, and it was made by a little, probably sort of big kangaroo, emu-sized plant-eating dinosaur called an ornithopod. So it probably looks something like this. And we found lots of different types of, or well, different sizes of Winternopus latimorum tracks in the area around Womerden. Um, we found trackways so where they're running across the rocks, um, different styles of preservation. We've got a lot of information on Winternopus latimorum. And that's just, that's just one particular track type. So this is you know, probably over a year or so to get to this point. But the thing to remember here is this issue of the tides. So this is at about half, half tide, so it's about seven metres or so. so here is about half a kilometre from the beach. And all that goes underwater every day and more of it gets exposed. So you can't just head out there and, and casually do your thing because you're going to get washed away. The crocodiles are going to come in. Um, <laughs> it's kind of tricky business. So we started in 2014 digitally mapping this area. We were able to get a, a big Australian Research Council grant to do this. And what it involved was getting above the tracks in the air using airborne laser scanning or airborne LIDAR in a small aircraft. Um, we did this with, we teamed up with Airborne Research Australia at Flinders University. Um, we did a lot of high definition aerial photography at the same time. And we also used drones to fly closer to some of the areas because obviously a plane goes pretty quick and covers a, a large swathe of ground, whereas with the drone you could focus on smaller areas. On the ground, we started using 3D digital photography, so taking lots of photos of, of a particular area and then aligning them to make 3D models. And also working with CSIRO, we started to do handheld laser scanning using a device called Zebedee. So all of a sudden we've got all these amazing gadgets and technology at our disposal. So this is Jorg Harker, that's me. This is his plane, Airborne Research Australia. And what he would do is fly up, and here he is at, at Womerden at James Price Point. And as he would fly, he would just take hundreds and hundreds of photos. He'd also laser scan over areas that we had told him to go based on what we'd found on the ground. This is what it's like flying with Jorg in this plane. It's like a glider with a motor, so it can go low and slow, is what it's all about. So this is Jorg coming in. So this is Womerden. This is all the rock at, at low tide. So we're trying to cover all that and map all that and scan it for tracks. So this is a way to, to start to cover a lot of ground. And it was a lot of fun with Jorg flying back and forth. He'd probably have to do five or six passes to get enough information for each little area that we were interested in. So that was Jorg in his plane. And then we also had our drone. We, just, we decided to coin it the, the dino drone for obvious reasons. <laughs> so we'd get, there's the dino drone there. It's an um, Inspire um, DJI drone. So it's got a, a 4K camera. The props get out of the way of the camera and it has full rotation. You can have two people controlling it. So we'd fly it down low over the tracks and do exactly what Jorg did. We'd take lots of overlapping photographs. This is just to show you what it's like with the drone at, at Womerden. 
So this is literally right at James Price Point, pretty much smack where this LNG precinct was supposed to go. So we control it just with an app through your phone. Um, one person can fly it, the other one can control the camera. So you pretty much this is good, you just sit on the beach, don't have to worry about those crocodiles and just focus on your phone like you do the rest of the time. But of course, we needed to know where the tracks were for where we had to fly. So you couldn't just fly over areas and hope you're going to find tracks. We still had to do a lot of that on the ground. But this gives you a sense of just how much rock we had to cover. So there are tracks all over this. Um, we worked out it's probably about two and a half square kilometres of rock that's got dinosaur tracks on it. So this is how it works with the drone, just like it does with the aerial photography, so lots of photos, you come down over areas of interest, take lots more photographs and video. Um, we also do the same thing with camera mounted tripod or tripod mounted cameras. This is scanning back and forth over an area where there's a track. And then this is the 3D laser scanner that CSIRO used. And this is wherever you walk, this thing fires off an array of lasers, they bounce back into a sensor and it starts to piece together um, the 3D space, so the, all those coloured lines are the track of Rob with the Zebedee. So for instance, this is just one area, this is around where those theropod tracks were first found by the Girl Guides, um, Ganthium Point or Minyear. These are spots where there are tracks, so we could fly over it with Yorg's plane and map them that way. We could zoom in close, but you lose a lot of detail there, or we could get in and have a good look with the dino drone or on the ground. And in various, we could sort of do it in various scales. So we could look at the whole, you know, five kilometres of coast, or we could zoom right in on a couple of spots where there are tracks. So this is that sort of 3D landscape that's been created. And this is a, an area that we wanted to, to map where there were dinosaur tracks. And these are some of the tracks that relate to Megalosaurus brumensis. So here's a map of the tracks, and you can zoom right in on individual tracks and get them in really good detail. So those are the little contours that we add with using various software, and then you can colorize it to make high parts red and deep bits blue. And we can just flip this around and do stuff with it on the computer. Um, once you've got all that, you can then just start to go berserk and have your own sort of virtual dinosaur reality world and this is a little 3D model that we created from that data. So there's the tracks there, you can decide you want to go back, you want to go in, you want to spin around. And this is a fantastic way not only for us to do our research but it also is a way to digitally conserve these areas that are in this really dynamic environment um, and that are often hard to get to and we're now working with the West Australian Museum to bring a lot of this stuff into their new exhibit. So, six years later, because we discovered there were a lot of dinosaur tracks in this area, thousands of dinosaur tracks. The job of documenting them turned out to be way bigger than <laughs> we thought it would be. Um, and it took us a long time to get this done. It just came out um, in March. Um, but we were really careful about the science we did because we knew what was at stake and we knew how carefully it would all be scrutinised. We're talking about something that could potentially derail a $45 billion LNG precinct. Thankfully, by the time this came out, the project had already collapsed in 2013. National Heritage listing and then all that pressure that had been placed on Barnett and Woodside eventually resulted in them pulling out because it was just taking too long to get forward with it. So it was becoming more and more expensive all the time. But that's great for us because it allowed us to push on with the science. So that's out now, 152 pages. I've read it about a million times. Um, two years in peer review, but we've done it. And what we've done is sort out how many different types of dinosaurs are represented in this area. Um, and we've worked out that there's at least 21 different types of tracks and probably the same number of animals that left them. So remember back in the 60s we had 
Megalosaurus brumensis, one single theropod track. We found some Megalosaurus brumensis tracks, but then we found four other different types of theropod tracks that we cannot link up. They're not just sort of variants of Megalosaurus. Um, ones like these are significantly bigger, different sort of angles to the toes and things. This one here, really fat-toed and aligned, almost parallel, looks a lot like a Chinese track called Yangsipus, but this one is distinct. So some of them, we can assign them to, to known tracks, like Megalosaurus premensis. Others, like this Yangsipus track that, that's distinct, we decided to give it a new species name, so that, that relates to a new species or new type of track. Others, like these ones here, they seem to be distinct, but we don't have enough. We'd like to have a sequence of them. We'd like to have more examples of them. Um, so for these ones, we've proposed what are referred to as morphotypes, so the particular groups of tracks that in 10 years' time, we might completely revise this, but at least it's up there as a working model for what we think is going on. So just to show you this particular one here, theropod morphotype A, um, this is the only example of it. Here's me and Richard. There's these little tracks here. They're only about that long. And they were probably made by an animal that might have looked something like this, so about just under a metre or so at its hips and maybe two or three metres long, so not much bigger than a sort of oversized emu. <coughs> so that's that particular track. Um, far and away, the most common types of tracks in this area are those of the sauropods. They definitely seem to have been the most abundant dinosaurs in this area. There was at least six different types, and our sort of estimates of the diversity of sauropod tracks has ranged from, from sort of three or four up to at one point, I think we had eight, but eventually settled on six. Only one of them was good enough to name, and for a lot of these names, these new names, we worked with the Marja and other people and some linguists at the University of New South Wales to use local language terms that told us something about what these tracks meant. So Ubergitima means little thunder, and anyone who knows their sauropods know that sauropods are the thunder lizards, so this was the, the little thunder um, and folks I honouring Paul Folks, who was the first person to find these sauropod tracks in that area. <coughs> this one has, has gotten a lot of interest. Um, I'll, I'll show you that in a sec. Just to give you a sense of what it's like trying to sort these sauropod tracks out, these are all sauropod tracks. It's like if you went down to, your, you're on a farm, and you go down to the dam and the cows and the cattle and the kangaroos have all made a mess in the mud. This is what it's like in some of these areas, but it's in stone and it's been preserved um, from 130 million years ago. There's a really nice one there, but they're not very considerate, these sauropods. They trampled each other's tracks. They walk in wiggly lines all the time, make it really hard for us paleontologists to make sense of them. One of the, the most spectacular ones, I think, of, of those of Morphotype A, um, this particular one, probably a lot of people might have seen this photo, um, we didn't recognise this as a track for quite a while just because it's so big. It's 1.75 metres long. So that's the, the sort of toe area, and this is the heel here, and Richard, um, that's a 40 centimetre long rule that he's holding. <coughs> now, an animal of that size, leaving a track like that, is probably about 5.5 to 6 metres at the hip. With tracks, you know, we can say a lot about the foot, we can estimate maybe the hip height, but things like the length of the tail and the neck and stuff, we're sort of stretching it a little bit. So we, we tend to just stick with generalised sort of silhouettes of things, and it's more about hip height rather than overall length. But this size dinosaur could easily be over 30 metres long, and there are skeletons of dinosaurs that big that have been found in places like South America. And when you consider that Australia was connected to South America, via Antarctica for most of the Cretaceous. It's no surprise that we're starting to see evidence of these giant animals in the Kimberley. Now, on its own, if there was only one, you'd be like, yeah, is it really a track, something that big? Um, but there's a number of them. Here's Nigel Clark, um, Louise's partner. This is a, that's the footprint there, and that's the hand of a slightly smaller one. We've got several tracks now 
of that size. And the thing that really tipped us off with these was this particular one here. This is a really nice example of this track type. That's the, with the foot there, this big heel region. There are the toes, and then this is the hand. And we're in the process there. That's Linda and Anthony Romilio, one of my co-authors, making a silicon cast of this huge track. Ornithopods, remember a little Winternopus? He was one of four different types of ornithopod tracks. So this is the group of dinosaurs that includes things like Quantosaurus, um, Mataburosaurus, but we're dealing with animals here that are sort of 20 million or so years older. So Winternopus, we've seen that before. This is a, a sort of fat-toed, bigger example of Winternopus that we named after Louise Middleton. And then this one is my favourite track. This is the replica that we made of it. This is Walmerden Ichnus. It's the mark of Walmerden. And this is a really unusual track. So there's, that's the third toe. This is the second toe. And this is the, the fourth toe going into a heel. It looks a lot like the big duck-billed dinosaur tracks that you find in the Lake Cretaceous of North America and Asia. Seeing this in the lower Cretaceous rocks of Australia is quite a surprise. We don't know if it's the same sort of dinosaur, as if it's an early example of a big duck-billed dinosaur or a hadrosaurid, or if it's something entirely different, an Australian variant of the same thing. So that's Walmart and Ichnus, and the species name honours Marja Richard Hunter. And then this one here, Amblodactylus. This is um, similar to some of the big tracks that you get at Lark Quarry. So these are the, the sorts of theropods, ornithopod track makers that might have made those particular tracks. Here's the um, holotype. That's the, the actual real Walmart and Ichnus track. And these are some of the 3D models that we use, uh, that we created from, from that using the photographs and the laser scanner. And they're the ones that we studied when we were writing all this up. And then, <coughs> really exciting, are all the armoured dinosaur tracks. And not just one potential stegosaur track, but maybe two, possibly three different types. And these are different to the ones that were described back in, or the single track that was described back in the 90s. That's this one here. It's a handprint, a five-fingered handprint. These here belong to a completely different animal that we can be very certain about the fact that it was a stegosaur. So stegosaurs have three big fat toes on the hind feet and then either four or five little fingers in the hand. So this one's got three big fat toes and then part of the heel down here and then four in the hand. Um, this is a giant example of it. Um, this particular one we've called Gubbina which is the, the word, Nulingan word for shield in this area. And, and Paddy Rowe was often seen carrying his, his governor around. And these are the, the thyreophrans, the armoured dinosaurs. Thyreo means shield bearer. Um, so these are the shields of the Kimberley stegosaurs. This is a little stegosaur. We named it after Paddy Rowe, who also went by the name of Lulu. And then... Mukey, I, Stephen Mukey, he's the ethnographer and linguist that we work with naming all these things. And then a few other things, possible ankylosaur. And the stegosaur tracks, the governor tracks, are, are really quite spectacular. Here's a, really, here's a nice one here. And this is a track that Louise and Nigel found. Um, and it's actually a trackway made by this sort of large-bodied stegosaur, governor Rowarum. So we can, <coughs> that's a reconstruction of what we think this animal might have look, looked like. Really big feet and teeny tiny little hands. And there are a number of tracks where all of a sudden the handprints disappear. And it's just these big fat three-toed tracks going along. And all we can work out is that the stegosaur that made these was capable of getting up on its hind legs. Probably a bit like a pangolin. Um, and getting along like that because there's no other way that it can leave these tracks. The rocks don't lie. And this, you know, you might go, what are you talking about, two-legged stegosaurs? The same sort of thing has been proposed for stegosaur tracks in the Morrison 
where there are similar things, where there's like three big fat three-toed tracks with no handprints associated with them. So here's an example of Australian two-legged stegosaur. So all up, all those things together, we think it's probably around 21 different types of dinosaurs in this fauna represented by tracks. And this is the most diverse dinosaur fauna represented by tracks anywhere in the world. You know, we, we spent a lot of time going through them all, trying to sort it out. Is this, this one different to that? Are they the same? Could this be a variant of this? Um, nutting it down, that was as low as we could get it. It's probably higher. And what's really exciting is that this is that stretch of coast. There's Womadon, there's Cadalacan further south, and Inayari. Three main areas where we get tracks in. In each one, you see at least sort of 10 to 12 different types of tracks represented. So it's the same sort of diversity all the way along the coast. Um, and what it really shows you is like a snapshot in time from 130 million years ago, because most of these tracks are in the same horizon. Okay, so it'd be like looking out over the Serengeti and herds of wildebeests and antelope and stuff and the odd lion here and a leopard there. But here in the Cretaceous, you're looking at herds of stegosaurs and, and sauropods, some big ornithopods over there and a couple of little theropods hanging around. It would have been a complete dinosaur ecosystem that is preserved in these rocks at this point um, around Walmerton. The brown are all the rocks where we get the tracks. So thankfully, now we can talk about this area where we've got the world's most diverse dinosaur track fauna and not a LNG precinct where we would have lost all of it. I wouldn't be here tonight had that been approved. It would have probably been halfway through production by now. So thankfully that didn't happen and now we can sort of celebrate this area for a completely different reason and one that hopefully we'll see it um, continue to gain notoriety for all the right reasons into the future. So just getting back to where it all started. So what now does this tell us about Australia's dinosaur fauna? So here's all our sauropods and Mudaburrosaurus and things from Queensland and Victoria. Now for down here, where we just used to have this big blank space, I can fill it with the broom dinosaur fauna. And all of a sudden we've got a much complete, more complete picture for Australia's dinosaur fauna during the early Cretaceous. And what we can see is that a lot of what is present in the middle Cretaceous from Queensland and Victoria was already there 130 million years ago. We already had a big diversity of sauropods. There was probably an even higher diversity of theropods and ornithopods. We had armoured dinosaurs, um, but for the first time we've seen stegosaurs in the Australian fossil record. And some of the bigger sauropods and definitely the stegosaurs seem to disappear after this time and we don't see them again. Maybe we'll find one next week, but at the moment that's the last of the stegosaurs that we get in Australia in this time period. And this is really a holdover of dinosaur faunas from the late Jurassic. So it's not that different what we see in Australia now to what we see in the late Jurassic in South America and Africa and to some degree North America and China because the, all those areas were much more connected back then and this is just a remnant of that persisting into the Cretaceous. So there's a lot of exciting stuff for us to do now sort of working out what all this means in terms of the biogeography and getting really into what all these dinosaurs were doing. All we've really done now is sort them out. We haven't really done much on, on their life, which we can. But I think overall for me, if I had to look back on this, there's a lot of amazing discoveries and stuff, probably the highlight of it, and it continues to be something that I get really inspired by, is you know the sharing of knowledge. So two ancient, you know, an ancient world and a new one coming together. We're both really into these tracks. We both can, can gain information from them. We can share and, and learn from each other. So sitting there on the beach with Phil Rowe talking about dinosaur tracks and wandering around with, with Rich, Richard Hunter, learning what he knows about them, me telling him what I know. I don't know anywhere else where science and culture, ancient culture, come together in such a unique way. It's a really special place and in the years to come we'll, we'll try and do everything we can to, to promote that even further. So I'll finish up, sorry I've gone a little bit over. Um, huge 
number of people have, have helped us along the way. I should acknowledge first Galara Baloo and then also Yaru um, for people around, for track sites around Broome. Um, we've now set up a group called the Dinosaur Coast Management Group, sort of interested community members, representatives from various indigenous communities, ourselves, to try and work out how to manage this incredible resource. Um, people have helped with photography. There's all the people that went before us. Um, people in my lab and co-authors on, on this big monograph that we've done and other work. Um, and then, of course, we've got funding from the Australian Research Council and the University of Queensland, among others. So with that, I'll, I'll finish and take you back 130 million years ago to when that place was really spectacular. All right, thank you. Fantastic job, Steve. So we're going to take some questions. We have time for a few questions. So if you've got a question written down, wave it in the air. Leonie will come and grab those off you. Um, obviously, we will be back next month, June 19th. We I can't tell you the speakers just yet, but um, watch this space. Check out the website, hop on Facebook or Twitter, and more will follow very soon. All right, so I'm going to go to Twitter first. Uh, first question is from Phil, who asks, have you looked at permanently submerged rock to see if there are prints? <laughs> at one point, we did consider swimming with dinosaurs. Um, <laughs> so we thought, you know, they're going to be underwater half the time. Maybe we'll just get in the water with them. Um, but what we discovered, it's really hard to see the tracks underwater because there's so much sediment gets moved around and the current associated with those tides, it just, you just kind of get swept away, plus all the, the dangers of the things lurking in the water. Our collaborators who um, do the laser scanning and the photography, they've now got the capacity to scan through water, so we can start to expand our search offshore, but really it's, it's pretty much what's on the beach when the tide goes out, because the stuff that's underwater all the time, gets completely encrusted in corals and oysters and that sort of thing. And the stuff that's up on the beach gets covered in sand that's right up the top. So it's in that intertidal zone that we've unfortunately or fortunately have to, have to focus all our work. Yeah. Okay, and so the flip side of that question, do you think you'll discover these in inland areas away from the coast? Well, if you go inland, everything's buried under... Holocene and Quaternary desert sands, Aeolian sands. So you saw those red cliffs in a lot of the photos. That's all Pindan sand that's blown in over the last sort of million years or so and buried all the rocks. So there's a lot of broom sandstone out there, but half of it's underwater, half of it's buried by, by sand, and then there's that little strip along the intertidal zone where we can get to it. So. That's where we focus all our efforts. And I'm quite happy hanging on the beach, I've got to say. <laughs> Except for the crocs. So, yeah. I like crocs too, so it's not too bad. Just okay. got to not get eaten. Um, so Adrian asks, how do you know that these tracks are not artefacts created by another process? Um, are there any tail impressions? Um, well, I mean, the main thing in this sort of environment being the intertidal zone, there's obviously lots of rock pools, potholes, there's all sorts of erosional features and it's often, you know, we, we spend a lot of our time going, is it a track, isn't it, mm, I don't know about that. And we sort of decided at some point, you know, we could forever be contemplating all these little bumps and things in the rock and we just focused on things that we could be sure about. So if I could take a photo of something or a cast and convince you guys that it's a track, they, they were the ones that we looked at. So. There are thousands of those, and there's probably many thousands more things that may or may not be tracks, we're not sure, but definitely have to focus on, on that sort of stuff and try to work out, yeah, if there are, it's not just footprints, if there are other sorts of impressions. So far, we haven't really seen anything like that, but with the really big tracks, what we've seen, particularly in areas around Broome, and this is some work that Tony Tholben did, is that those animals were so heavy that with certain substrates, particularly where there was more lagoonal sort of areas where there were more muds and things, their feet would liquefy the sediment and they'd warp it to like a metre or so 
below the surface. So now when you look at those rocks, sometimes you see a track here and then these warped layers underneath which erode out in various ways. So some, some of them like are the size of this, this stage. But that might be a whole area that's been compressed by a, an animal walking over it or it could be the remnants of one or two tracks. So it does start to get really tricky. We spend a lot of time trying to figure it out. All right, uh, there are more questions, but I'm going to finish with just one more, and then Steve will be outside with food for discussion. From Jeanette on Twitter, is there an Australian version of the Green River Formation where amateurs can fossick? Um, there are a couple of areas where you can fossick. Probably the best one is up near Richmond um, in northwest Queensland or central western Queensland where Cronosaurus Corner, a little sort of... Um, Museum's been set up there, and they've I have got my a Cronosaurus corner mug. Yep. <laughs> they've got a quarry, an old road quarry, that once a year, and I think it's coming up in in about a month's time. They have a a dig where people can go and fossick, and that's a really good place to go, just for you know your odd little bit here and there. All right. Well, see you in Richmond for maybe a special brew science sometime then. Uh, thank you. Give, give please a huge round of applause to Steve for a fantastic tour. <laughs> Um, please join us again next month, hop on the website, and we'll see you all soon.